was, that was one of the several thousand people that pulled their coins off of Celsius before uh, they shut down withdrawals, um, which I'd been warning about really loudly since early May, um, right after finding out that they had uh, pulled $500 million worth of user funds out of Anchor, which was like an obvious Ponzi scheme. <laughs> Hi, Cory. Thanks for coming on Sunny Bitcoin. Hey, Sunny. Good to be here. So, Cory, tell us a little bit about your background and your motivation to start uh, Swan Bitcoin. Yeah, sure. So, I uh, grew up in uh, in SF area in Seattle, which is why I still am uh, wearing this Seahawks t-shirt today. Uh, but uh, I was really interested in journalism real early on and uh, went to undergrad for broadcast journalism and actually tried it. I was a local uh, NBC TV reporter and anchor as a, as an undergrad in Columbia, Missouri. Uh, didn't love it, but I'd been online since, you know, 93 or something like that. And the internet was kind of taken off and I decided to go that direction instead. Interned at Microsoft, went to go work for them and kind of just kept on moving further and further toward the business side of things. Worked for Microsoft, then uh, Morgan Stanley in, in marketing for their uh, private client services division. And then went to MBA University of Chicago and then didn't know what I wanted to do still. So consulting, if you have no idea what you're going to do. So I was at McKinsey's New York office for a while. Uh, caught the tail end of the private equity bubble, like 06 to 08, and did consulting in private equity for a bit. And uh, then finally, with I think it was probably just the global financial crisis in 08, 09 that kind of clued me in that I I really wanted to do something where I had more control uh, over sort of the results of my labors and my networking and you know the decisions that I was making. And that sort of meant entrepreneurialism and and, and in my case, I got really attracted to early stage tech startups and wanted to get into that world. So I finally made a good career choice uh, leaving consulting. I was at another management consulting firm and, and left for um, Google in, in 2011 with the express purpose of kind of treating it like internet business school. So from, the, from day one, I was networking with VCs and founders and I started throwing like a, I called it Tech Salon Monthly in Chicago and carried that through to LA when we moved out here. And kind of did that the whole time I was at Google and, uh, you know, felt well enough networked after uh, a couple of years at Google and moving to L.A. and getting up to Silicon Valley a lot uh, to jump out and start being a full time angel and advisor to early stage venture backed startups. So that's really what I've been doing for the last nine years. And uh, it's been a good run I mean, you know, over 60 companies have had 15 some exits. And, uh, and then halfway through that, I, uh, I got smacked with the Bitcoin bug in the, uh, the previous bull market run in 2017, like a lot of people, uh, a lot of noise in my network around the, uh, you know, the ICOs and Ethereum, this and that, and, you know, all these different theses on what we would now call friction tokens, but everybody thought every marketplace should have its own token and payment network and things like that. And, uh, you know, just kind of a really immature view on the whole thing. Didn't spend enough time on Bitcoin out of the gate. Luckily, I had some people take me aside and, you know, at least point me to some resources and some books and things like that. So after almost a year, about 11 months of messing around with with altcoins and getting involved in all that kind of stuff, I finally kind of saw the light and understood how different Bitcoin was from everything else in the space. And that, you know, really all the altcoins trend towards zero uh, after a pump and then kind of a dump in the long run. You know, only one of 20,000 altcoins has ever had a second all time high in Bitcoin terms uh, three or more years after the first. And that was just Dogecoin last year because Elon pumped the heck out of it. Um, but essentially, you're just kind of better off focusing on Bitcoin. And then also, like, what do these things do? You know, the altcoins, you know, there's there's really no real world product market fit for a single one of them yet. They're all just kind of speculation on speculation. And there's cool trading infrastructure and all this kind of amazing stuff going on for trading in essentially something that's like a blend between online poker and, you know, maybe online gaming a little bit with some social dynamics. And can you be an insider and can you get the good deal with the VCs? And can you, you know, suss out on chain, you know, where the market makers are going to dump and get out first and, you know, kind of be the kind of be the smart one. So there's some of that, like, kind of like a, you know, like a massive multiplayer online role playing game to some degree. So I understand why it's kind of addictive to be in crypto, but like you're not actually building anything of lasting value in that space. And, and I think what Bitcoin can do um, besides the economic returns and kind of the economic rationale for, for being in that space versus the rest is it's just 
absolutely fascinating what comes with actually having sound money outside of the control of governments and people. And, and I just think that's going to usher in this incredible era of, of uh, increased productivity and peace uh, on an order of something that we've never, ever seen before. Um, so that's kind of where I've come to as my understanding of, of what Bitcoin is and where we're headed. And I just can't imagine working on anything else. And it was after coming to that realization and sort of Bitcoin as a mind virus kind of taking over all of my spare time and then more and more of my professional time. And then I started consulting and advising Bitcoin companies. And all of a sudden, I couldn't imagine doing anything other than starting a Bitcoin company. Uh, I got this company started uh, June of 2019. So three years ago, uh, came up with the Swan name uh, in January of 2020 and launched the product in March of 2020. Great timing right after uh right after the nasty dump and then uh, in V-shaped recovery that we were just kind of on the cusp of. But uh, it's been a great run so far. Uh, we're now 60 people, uh, just raised some money in April on a 200 mil valuation. And, you know, I think we're a Bitcoin financial services company. We sell Bitcoin. We work with the wealth management channel with Swan Advisor Services. We have Swan Private Client Services, which uh, lots of YPO members are part of. And, and y'all get it for free, by the way. We don't... Uh, I have free free membership in Swan Private for uh, for all YPO folk if y'all want that, um, and yeah, I think just like clear running ahead basically in this in this Bitcoin only space, um, and our goal is to be the first consumer focused Bitcoin only company uh, public on the Nasdaq within the next two to three years. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack. I want to unpack all the pro different products that you offer, and I love the new term that you use for shit coins, which is friction coins. I love that. This is the first I've heard uh, the word friction coins. <laughs> that, was, that was this very specific kind of altcoin. It was basically saying, hey, in our marketplace or our market network or our little ecosystem, we're only going to allow you to pay with this token, like a Chuck E. Cheese token, right? And so that we, we basically, they got correctly called friction tokens, uh, you know, sort of post late 17 when people started to explain that, you know, if you only need something to pay, you're going to quickly acquire what you need to pay just before you pay for it. And then if you get any back, you're going to sell it into a better store of value. And that kind of gets at, you know, the progression of, of, of how an asset monetizes and the fact that you can't actually, other than it maybe being enforced by government at the point of a gun, like fiat currencies, you can't actually have a medium of exchange that's not a store of value. And I think that's where, you know, a small subsection or so, small subset of early Bitcoiners understood that from the jump, including Hal Finney and Satoshi himself. And then I think it was carried through by the people that actually had a background in Austrian economics and kind of libertarian thought and sound money circles that kind of carried the torch for four or five years until we all kind of came to understand that after the ICO pump and dump of 1718. And we realized, oh, my gosh. Like you can't have medium of exchange, the second use of money or unit of account, pricing it in that money, the third use of money, unless you have something that people actually want to hold as money and store their value in. And I think that's kind of something that a lot of people that are, you know, skipping Bitcoin and getting into crypto, they're missing that none of these things can hold value over time unless they are a trusted store of value outside of state control. Yeah, it's a it's an amazing rabbit hole, and there is it, it's great to see more and more people going down that space. So Swan Bitcoin is a place where you can buy and sell uh, Bitcoin, and um, you've of course consciously named the company Swan Bitcoin, a bit like Sunny yeah. Bitcoin, and not Swan Crypto. Uh, don't you think that you lose out on a huge business opportunity by limiting yourself to Bitcoin and not the other uh, shit coins, altcoins, friction coins? No, I think the uh, I mean, the opportunity is created by the fact that the crypto exchanges have these, you know, 100 plus unregistered securities trading on their platform. And, you know, the fact that these things are almost all just kind of various versions of scams and pumps and dumps or or maybe like a, a long venture experiment, if you want to be generous, that's, you know, going to probably fail in the end. Um, and so I think them leaving that space wide open for for Bitcoiners to run Bitcoin only businesses is fantastic. I I hope that Coinbase keeps on pumping these shit coins forever. <laughs> um, we don't actually have a sell button, by the way. It's a uh, it's a it's a one way Bitcoin purchase platform. You can sell, but you have to like you have to message us or uh, or uh, email us or call us if you want to sell. I love that. This is honestly this is the 
first true Bitcoin exchange. I mean, it has all the properties and principles of Bitcoin embodied in an exchange. And I was running a Bitcoin exchange, uh, you know, in the past. And I think I went through a, I, I mean, a crisis with myself when we were listing all of these altcoins, because this is not the reason that I started the Bitcoin exchange in 2014. But after 2017, I think uh, just with so many other stakeholders, uh, it became almost impossible not to list it. But yeah, you, you show it that it's possible to be Bitcoin only and still be an exchange, which is great. So you mentioned a couple of products that you offer. Can you just elaborate that a little bit? Like, you know, the retail product, I think that you're mentioning and so on advisory, I think that you mentioned and again, and also so on private, uh, if you can just unpack that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, really, it's, uh, I think we're the first real sales team there to support high net worth individuals and family offices and, you know, small and medium sized corporates around the world with all of the complicated things that come with buying Bitcoin, understanding it, moving on the path to self-custody, setting up multi-sig, thinking about inheritance planning, putting it in complicated, you know, structures like trusts and LLCs and, you know, SAs and GMBHs and whatever else you have around the world. Um, so we have clients in the hundred some countries and uh, it's been just a joy to, uh, you know, see the the reaction of people who realize that there's a company that actually wants them to get their, their complicated situations handled and help them think through portfolio allocation and, and actually has a model that sustains doing this, right? Because if you're a crypto exchange, you don't have any incentive whatsoever to encourage people to buy and hold Bitcoin. You want people to take their money and flip it in and out of altcoins 50 times this year so that you can make trading fees on every single transaction. Um, and they can't have a sales team focused on Bitcoin because there's no salesperson that could effectively, first of all, they couldn't truthfully represent a buy and hold use case for a bunch of cryptos. And then second, like nobody is eloquent and sort of studied on, on all of these altcoins in the first place. So, you know, being able to narrow your focus and kind of get through the aperture of Bitcoin only, it then opens up a, a whole realm of possibility of the things that you can do with the business once you restrict it to that. I liken it to kind of uh, how creative people are with the character limit on Twitter, you know, or just being able to post, you know, only pictures on Instagram. Well, what are you going to do? You're going to come up with all these creative ways to fit that format, right? Um, I'm too old for Instagram, but I hear it's pretty neat. My wife likes it. Um, <laughs> so I think that's that's it. You know, once you decide like we're only going to sell Bitcoin, then you're focused on selling Bitcoin really, really well in all the different ways that people want to buy Bitcoin. So we've got the app, we've got the website, we've got the Swan Private Client Services, we've got the wealth management channel, we've got dozens of uh, of RAA firms and and FAs signed up that are going to be launching here in the next month or two. Um, so if you've got a money manager and you're interested in them, uh, you know, working with Bitcoin uh, through their client base and, and getting it in their hands, like that's what we're equipped to do. And we have some of the smartest people in the world with a ton of experience, both in Bitcoin and in, in uh, wealth management that have built that platform and, you know, kind of to spec exactly to work with those people, the way that their business works today with their tools, et cetera. And then we have a, a Swan IRA product coming out in Q3, um, you know, that's going to be a uh, you know, undercutting like Bitcoin IRA by like 95% on pricing. So, you know, no load and low, low monthly fee, uh, even undercuts choice by like, God, they're like 150 bucks a month. We're 21 bucks a month. So what is that? It's a lot less, I don't know, 85% less than, than choice. So I think that'll be great to have that in market. And, um, and then the app later this year will actually have a self-custody lightning wallet built right into the Swan app. So that's pretty exciting. And then we just have a lot of like ecosystem projects that we do. You know, I'm, uh, we created Bitcoinerjobs.com, which is the biggest job site in Bitcoin, where all the Bitcoin companies list their jobs and hundreds of people have found employment through that in the last year. We just launched Bitcoinerevents.com last month. Uh, I'm the founder of Bitcoiner Ventures, which is a really large, active uh, Bitcoin syndicate with over 600 LPs, including a lot of YPOers. Um, Bitcoinerventures.com, if you want to sign up for that. Um, and, you know, we basically do like one or two deals every quarter investing into Bitcoin startups. And recently started El Zonte Capital, where I'm a GP. That's a committed capital uh, seed, maybe some A rounds out of that, but a small one to get started. Um, that's me and Max Kaiser and Stacey Herbert, uh, the queen, queen and king, 
the crazy king and his queen of Bitcoin, uh, the mad king, I guess. Anyway, but, you know, big megaphone, big network, lots of super fans around the world. So it's uh, it's a really good anchor for a venture fund to uh, distribute some capital to some worthy companies. Um, and then I guess the last piece of uh, of news is uh, we're throwing the largest Bitcoin only conference in the history of the world this fall. Uh, 3000 people at the Santa Monica Airport, Barker Hangar, November 10th and 11th. You can go to packbitcoin.com. PAC Bitcoin.com. Uh, no altcoin speakers, uh, no altcoin sponsors, but you're all welcome to come and, and hang out and, uh, and be at the conference. So uh, come meet some friendly Bitcoiners in, in LA this fall. Are you sure there's not even a little bit of temptation to take a, a non Bitcoin sponsor? <laughs> I don't think so. It just kind of like poisons the whole thing. I mean, there I said no altcoin sponsors. We will actually have some very large household name brands um, sponsoring the conference, but they have nothing to do with Bitcoin or crypto. Um, they just are aware that there's going to be a bunch of Bitcoiners and that that's, uh, for better or worse, a very sort of well-defined community um, whose passion for the people that support them or in the companies that support them. I often describe it as like, depending on your perspective, perspective, it's like 10 times worse or 10 times better than a CrossFitter. But either way, it's like 10 times more <laughs> than, than what cross. And I was a CrossFitter, you know, 10 years ago, and I, I couldn't stop talking about it, but I'm way worse about Bitcoin. Um, but, you know, imagine if you're a brand and you kind of sidle up and do some favors for that crowd. Um, I think Bitcoiners have proven that they really support, uh, you know, companies that, that get close to them and say positive things. You know, there's this, you know, Middle Eastern restaurant up in Canada called Tahini's Restaurant. And it's like famous and the, you know, the prime minister candidates come and they have to do their photo ops and everything at Tahini's because, you know, they got famous off the back of Bitcoiners. So you, you, you have a product called Swan Private, which you mentioned. Can you describe that product a little bit more, especially for, you know, YPOs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, sure. So you get assigned a managing director uh, and like literally that's your that's your rep is somebody that you can hit on WhatsApp, Telegram, text message, phone, email, pretty much whenever. Um, and these are some of the most knowledgeable people in the world about Bitcoin. This is people like Stefan Levera, who has uh, the Stefan Levera podcast that probably a lot of you have listened to. Um, Steven Lubko has been consulting to high net worth individuals about Bitcoin in their portfolios and how to store it and things like that for the last six years. Uh, John Har just came over a few months ago after 11 years on an institutional desk at Goldman, fell in love with Bitcoin a few years ago and couldn't imagine doing anything else. So, you know, that's a team of six or seven folks. Andy Edstrom is on that team. He wrote the book, Why Buy Bitcoin? Um, he owns a, 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 a financial management firm out here in Los Angeles and wrote the book, Why Buy Bitcoin? Which is the first and only book written about Bitcoin for the financial advisor audience by an FA. Um, so, you know, it's just a, it's just a really good crew, amazing support, amazing service, uh, no fee, you know, we basically, it's $3,000 value annually, but no fee for, uh, for YPO folks. So come on in, check it out. And what's the business model for you for Swan Private? Uh, you said it's, yeah. it's $3,000 yeah, so on no fee. No fee there, 0.99% uh, <laughs> on transactions. That's it. So no fees for custody. Uh, free custody, free withdrawals, uh, literally just on on the buys and if you sell, which is unlikely because you know that it's for the long term. But if you did sell, it would be 0.99%. Um, right, yeah. yeah. You, you kind of mentioned that on the you know, YPO group, but I just wanted to make sure that uh, you, know, you have an opportunity to kind of explain that product a little bit more over here. Um, so Korean yeah, well, let me just, I'll, yeah. I'll tack on, like, then you also get, you get access to like the Swan private client services parties at the big Bitcoin conference in Miami in the spring. And then in, at the LA, uh, private event in the fall, we have uh, a monthly webinar only for Swan private members where we get, you know, kind of Bitcoin macro celebrities to come and, and talk about Bitcoin and answer questions. Uh, we have like, uh, you know investment banking research team quality research report that we do each month called Swan Private Insight. Uh, I realized that I'm not very creative with titling. Uh, I decided to call Swan's private Swan PCS and then later realized that, that I used to work for Morgan Stanley PCS. And then I was like, I fell in love with the name Insight for, uh, for so it's Swan Private Insight is the, uh, the monthly magazine. 
And then like a few weeks later, uh, I got my old McKinsey alumni newsletter and realized it was called Insight. It was like, I just, I have no originality whatsoever. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the plagiarism. Please don't hit me with trademark infringement. This is a very small business still today and we'll change the name if you hate it. Um, but that's where we are. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. I just, I kind of feel like Swan just came into my radar out of the blue and suddenly you guys were there everywhere. And I just realized you all are just a couple of years old, but I'll, you all have really made an impact in this short time. And in fact, I was just kind of going to comment that Bitcoin magazine, I think just two years back, just while you guys came on the radar, said that Swan Bitcoin has established itself as a new and powerful player in the Bitcoin on ramp and also the education space. So what are you doing in the education space? Yeah, I think those are actually very related questions because I think the reason that we've grown in profile and frankly in revenue and team so fast is because of the approach of uh, how we do our marketing. Our marketing is like 100% educational content about Bitcoin. So 40% of our staff actually creates content about Bitcoin. We have a unit called Swan Studios that, you know, produces movies and documentaries and, you know, things like that, including feature length. Um, kind of gets behind and helps package these things and helps get them, get them financed. We haven't shot one ourselves yet. Um, we do produce, I think, six shows at this point, including last week we debuted Hard Money, which is uh, the first like national network news quality weekly show on Bitcoin. Um, so that's airing on Bitcoin Magazine and Hedgeye so far. I think within three to six months, we'll have national cable distribution for that. Uh, the host is Natalie Brunel, who's an Emmy Award winning uh, former uh, network news reporter and anchor. And, you know, we built an actual studio in Malibu. So on PCH, we have Swan Studios and it's a soundstage with the green screen and the, you know, the network ca quality cameras and the teleprompter and the eggshell sound barriers and the whole deal. So, you know, there's a whole squad that's out there every Tuesday uh, shooting and getting the episode out by uh, by Thursday right now. I think we'll have it down to Wednesday within a couple of weeks and and hopefully in a few months we'll actually shoot Tuesday morning and get it out Tuesday night. That's amazing. I think a lot of Bitcoin podcasters also use your infrastructure to sometimes shoot their episodes and I've, I've, I've seen, them, <laughs> seen them giving yeah. you credits for it. Yeah, yeah. We've, I mean, we... We like to kind of, it is kind of a studio system, interestingly. We try to spot people on the way up and like grab them and, and help boost them and make them famous, which is what we've been doing with Natalie since meeting her last year and, you know, developing this show for her. Uh, similarly, a few of us were friends with Robert Breedlove when he was still in Los Angeles. And so, you know, he wanted to start doing a show about a year and a half ago. And we jumped in and, and produced and edited uh, the first three or four months of the What Is Money podcast. Um, including the Sailor series. So that was really cool to be involved in. And then uh, he's back in the stable now uh, after a year of getting sponsored by Nidig. He's back. We're his title sponsor and, and we're producing the show again, have been for the last few months. So um, good to have that going. And then, yeah, I mean, the stable of talent just kind of in Swan and around Swan is, you know, just really influential in the space. And I think it's a big part of the success and kind of the, the trust pointers on the internet pointing towards Swan is like, you know, a high integrity, high signal place to get Bitcoin information and, and to be able to to trust with, you know, your strategies and your execution on, on accumulating Bitcoin for the long haul. So there's this little tool online called Hive.one. I think you go, so you just check out Hive.one. It's basically like algorithmic rankings of, of influence within communities. So if you looked up Ethereum, it would have Vitalik at the top. Uh, in Bitcoin, it has Adam back at the top, as you'd kind of expect. But, you know, 11 of the top 100 work at Swan full-time and 17 of the top hundred are on the cap table. Um, the second place company has three. So I think, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of what we've tried to use as a strategy is to find out, you know, who are these people that have trust and authority and intelligence around Bitcoin? And then what else could they do for a company? And let's hire them to do that for the company. So, you know, Brady runs marketing and he has the Citizen Bitcoin podcast and Stefan runs is the MD of Swan International and runs his podcast and Tomer's our editor in chief and he wrote, you know, this beautiful book, Why Bitcoin and does, you know, an amazing essay on Bitcoin seemingly every other day and Andy wrote Why Buy Bitcoin, Jan wrote, I think the best book on Bitcoin, Inventing Bitcoin 
Anyway, somewhere over here is my favorite book on Bitcoin called Inventing Bitcoin. And, uh, and that's my co-founder and our CTO. And we give that away, by the way. You can go to swan.com slash free book and grab a free ebook or audio book. And um, I think it's just, uh, it's so short, so concise, and just kind of like the exact right level of detail for someone kind of new or even having been around for a while. Uh, and, it, and this is kind of a fun anecdote. So he's, uh, the reason it's so damn good is because one, you know, he's an engineer who happens to be a really good writer. So he doesn't believe in like wasted words. So it's not flowery Two, his wife is in, uh, administration in Chicago public schools. So he actually went and was a guest speaker teaching high school kids in Chicago about Bitcoin for a year. And based on, you know, all of the best analogies that hit and all of the ways that, you know, he found to explain different concepts and different elements of Bitcoin the best. That's what became the book. And a lot of times when you read a book, that's just like the perfect length and the perfect level of detail, you find that it came out of a course. It's one of the reasons I love uh, Peter Thiel's book, Zero to One, right? It's because he taught the course for a while and like they distilled the lecture notes down into this great book. And I think inventing Bitcoin is kind of like the Bitcoin version of of zero to one for startups. This, you are really, truly an amazing epicenter of Bitcoin resources. I mean, for the audience, the names that you mentioned are absolutely at the top of you know Bitcoin resources and Bitcoin education material. This is great to um, hear. You're also an advisor to Riot, which is, I believe, one of the largest mm-hmm. public listed Bitcoin mining companies. I'm not sure whether it's the largest, but it None is of them problem. are large anymore. They were large <laughs> six months ago. They were all large six months ago. <laughs> and that's what my question is, that, you know, mining companies got uh, windfall profits last year due to the China uh, Bitcoin, um, uh, you know, ban, mining ban and the Bitcoin price bull run. And since then, the hash rate has increased back to record new levels and Bitcoin's price has crashed, which has really hit uh, the, you know, profit margins of mining companies. And I think they're also forced to sell their Bitcoin holdings uh, what's the state of Bitcoin mining companies right now? And I know a lot of people invested in them. Do you recommend investing in them right now? I I don't really talk about it. I don't I don't know if it's really appropriate. I'm still on the advisory board of Riot. You know, I love that team and I think their operations are spectacular. And you know, I'm happy to talk about it in private. Like literally, if anybody's like super interested in it, you can seriously email me, Corey at swan.com and talk about any of this stuff. Um, I have a pretty you know, I seem to be doing about 15, 20% of my week is just kind of YPO one-on-one micro forums, which is great because I'm new. I just joined in, in January, so I don't mind reaching out and finding out about everybody. So i um, happy to do that. I think I've already met probably 30 Bitcoiners in YPO, which is awesome. Um, you know, I think that's how we met was just uh, I pinged a bunch of people that had RSVP'd to uh, Fred Teal's uh, from Marathon, his uh, his YPO Bitcoin meetup at the Miami conference, and I was like, "Hey, I'm in YPO. I want to talk Bitcoin." And so, thank you for responding to that to those of you who did. Uh, and yeah, so happy if you're if you're the type of person that was interested enough to listen this far in a Bitcoin related podcast, I'm happy to chat. Yeah, that that Telegram group was created by me, I think, about four years back. And for the first, for the during the bear market, there were like 10, 15 members, and then just suddenly shot up to six hundred members uh, over the last two years. So it's it's directly correlated to Bitcoin's price. Uh, did you go to consensus? And uh, how is it for a Bitcoiner to go to consensus? I went a couple of years back, and I thought that the event was about everything except Bitcoin. I I don't know whether it's still the same or do you participate in these uh, crypto events? No, I don't go to the crypto events. I did get invited to speak this year, which was kind of them. And, you know, I am friends with some of the Coindesk reporters, the ones that are like real reporters and not just crypto boosters. And then obviously the there's a handful of like hardcore Bitcoiners that work at Coindesk. And I'm friendly with those folks. Um, Jan, my co-founder, did go and he spoke on a panel with Adam back. Um, I'm not sure what about, but I guess it went, you know, pretty well. And, you know, they and everybody else that went had the same reaction. It's like, nobody here knows anything about Bitcoin. And that's so strange because they're actually, they wouldn't be here if not for Bitcoin and without all the, uh, sort of affinity marketing schemes surfing off of Bitcoin and trying to pretend that they had something new and better than Bitcoin. Otherwise that wouldn't exist at all. 
Um, but you know, that's the way of the world, man. When there's, when there's new technology that's poorly understood, you're going to get a flood of interest of people trying to make as much money by hook or by crook, um, as they can until the technology is better understood. And then the opportunity actually goes away. So they've got to get it while the getting's good. If they want to get those gains. Yeah. And I just, I think Bitcoin suffers from a unit buy. So everybody kind of thinks that they've missed the Bitcoin opportunity. And so they think that they're going to be smart enough to look for the next one, which is really a terrible beginner's mistake. You are quite aggressive with these mistakes. You can get 5,000 per dollar right now. You can get 5,000 Satoshis per dollar. Exactly. The unit buys, yeah. right? <laughs> Unbelievable. That's I mean, the thing. Yeah, geez. exactly. I was getting like, <laughs> like last fall, I was getting like 700 per dollar. Now you're getting like 5,000 per dollar. It's amazing. And so what Corey is talking about is the fact that each Bitcoin is divisible by 100 million units, which is a sad. And so you can get 5,000 sats for a dollar. That's the exchange rate rather than looking at Bitcoin's price, uh, uh, you know, in for a, against a Bitcoin. That's what he's talking about. Uh, but yes, and, and, and you tweet quite aggressively and openly against many of the other things that happen in the crypto space. I think I noticed, I, I noticed recently you changed your Twitter banner pic on your profile. Uh, and it's now a screenshot of a tweet by one of your followers uh, who tweeted. I kind of thought that you were a dick at first. Of course, he's referring to you. But God damn, you saved my ass, to be honest. Thanks. So um, what are the things that you hate the most uh, in the crypto space that you, tw- uh, that you tweet about, that you be a dick about? Well, that was that was one of the several thousand people that pulled their coins off of Celsius before uh, they shut down withdrawals, um, which I'd been warning about really loudly since early May, um, right after finding out that they had uh, pulled five hundred million dollars worth of user funds out of Anchor, which was like an obvious Ponzi scheme that I had yelled about starting in March, six weeks before it collapsed. I said it's a done deal. It's certain that it's going to collapse and go to zero. Anchor, UST, Luna was definitely going to go to zero. And it was obvious by March that that was going to happen just a matter of time. Um, And so seeing that Celsius had actually parked user funds in that scheme made me take a little bit of a closer look, find out that they'd lost 120 million in stake hound last fall, that they lost 50 million in Badger Dow. uh, I'm sorry, stake hound last summer, 50 million in Badger Dow in the fall, that their uh, CFO had been pulled out of the company and arrested in the fall that they'd been, you know, changing jurisdictions a couple of times. They got fired by their uh, custodian who didn't want to do business with them anymore, you know, on and on and on. And then, you know, the, the CEO founder, uh, Alex Mashinsky, unfortunately a, a former YPO member, unfortunately, but uh, you know, the guy had basically been lying about his background since marketing the, the ICO, which obviously was like a unregistered security when he marketed it, but he had claimed to, have raised a billion dollars for startups, had had $3 billion of exits, had invented VoIP, voice over internet protocol, and supposedly had the uh, the most successful IPO of 2004. And literally not one of those four claims is true. And it takes about five minutes on Google to sort of debunk all of them. And he's continued to claim all those things for the last four years. Um, that's egregious, but you know, much what's much worse is just the way that they marketed their product to retail investors, which was basically as a better savings account. Um, so their whole thing was, you know, all their T-shirts and hats and speeches where banks are not your friends and saying that banks could give you 8% interest if they wanted to, but they're greedy and they keep it, right? So just kind of an outright outright lie. And then contrasting themselves, essentially marketing themselves as a better, you know, high, higher interest rate savings account, even calling it deposits, but then in the fine print saying, hey, by the way, when we say deposits, we don't mean deposits. We mean you're an unsecured creditor to us and we can do whatever we want with your money and you have no rights whatsoever. And then just trading it out the back door with all these shady, you know, protocols and trying to make money. So you're essentially an unsecured lender to a prop desk or a, or a hedge fund essentially, but you're not getting 80% of the profits. Um, so just kind of egregious to, to have that kind of marketing in any business and, you know, particularly bad to be gathering retail deposits for something like that because they are, uh, especially in an unregulated space, like very unlikely to be able to see through the false claims and make their own their own decisions. So, you know, there's a reason that this type of behavior is is limited, you know, to 
institutions that want to participate in things like that. You know, it's institutions that actually lend to hedge funds and it's, you know, institutions or at least accredited investors that become LPs in hedge funds and they're fairly compensated. So the only thing that I've said over the last two years until, until right after the Luna collapse about the CFI lenders, so BlockFi, Voyager, uh, you know, Nexo, Celsius, all of them is that it's just really bad risk reward. That's seeking yield for your coins with these platforms. You're not being fairly compensated because you're essentially an LP in an unregistered hedge fund. And so you should at least be getting, you know, higher than MES lending rates. You should be in the twenties if you're going to get interest. And that's if they had, you know, proven operations and proper audits and weren't jurisdiction hopping and using false marketing. Like if they were a solid business, you'd be getting like 15 to 18% or north of 20. Um, or you'd be getting compensated like an LP. You'd get 80% of profits from their trading operation. So uh, that's generally been my take. I'm like, listen, like I don't have, I didn't used to have a view on, you know, whether BlockFi might collapse or might not. Obviously they just got shored up with some capital last week because they were going to collapse if they didn't get the money and they, they raised a down round of 85 on 915 after raising on a 5 billion six months ago. Um, so down more than 80% in valuation in six months. You know, Voyager got shored up with a cash infusion from Alameda, which is uh, Sam Bankman Freed. Um, Celsius didn't get any infusion because they didn't have any backers that cared about them and no, do ba no new backers, given all the information that's come to light about their management and about their operation, nobody wanted to back them. So they're stuck in, you know, trying to get out of these positions using the rest of whatever user funds they have to try to like make them whole and you know, we'll see how it plays out. I don't know. I mean, it, it sure seems like it's headed for a receivership. Um, if it's not, and they somehow get out of this without bankruptcy, they're still going to be facing so many lawsuits um, over the false marketing practices and just kind of what they've done with user funds over the past week that I just can't imagine. I would say that brand has like severely negative equity at this point and won't be a go forward business would be my guess. And I, I appreciate the important distinction that you just made. It's not a deposit. It's almost like giving money to a hedge fund without the benefits and the participation in the profit. So it's a difference. Uh, and that's the reason those interest rates that they give you uh, doesn't make sense. What are your views on other deposit uh, and lending platforms like uh, Ledin and Genesis, which you did not mention right now? Yeah, I mean you're somewhere on uh you're somewhere on a risk spectrum, right? So, you know, if you're on Ledger X or Binance or, you know, Bitfinex or something and those coins are staying right there in that ecosystem and they're just like, you know, that's just a funding rate basically, right? You're saying like, "Hey, I'm going to lend this coin to you so you can go short." And that's mediated by the platform. I think that risk is basically are they going to, you know, run away with your coins? And I don't think the major you know, kind of well-known exchanges would do that. That's kind of the same as if you like, if you leave your coins on the exchange at all, it's the same risk. So if you feel comfortable with the balance being on the exchange and the only place it's being lent is there, that should be fine. That's like the least risky. The next least risky is probably Genesis and the platforms that operate essentially as, as channel partners for Genesis, which uh, Ledin is one that most of their balance goes to Genesis. Genesis is the largest sort of oldest oldest running it's it's uh kind of the most trustworthy um with the most brand equity uh for that business i guess um so you know wherever it is on the spectrum it's you know probably among the least risky uh so if you absolutely must have yield i think gemini's earn product is on top of genesis and it's basically a front end for genesis not sure about that but i think it is and leaden definitely is um you know so that's kind of where i am like our private clients that absolutely insist on having some yield against my advice uh we work with leaden for those guys so yeah we do have some customers with with yield but i would never in a million years send them to BlockFi celsius or uh nexo some really valuable uh, you know comments there uh, do you think bitcoin has bottomed um maybe i don't know we're still watching this thing play out you know like I think you just got to like zoom out and make sure you have a uh, automatic recurring purchase plan going. You know, that was the first product we ever launched at Swan. And there was a reason it's because you can just be so Zen and not have to worry about this crap. If you literally just have an automatic buy going down every single day, 
I highly recommend every single one of you set up an automatic recurring purchase plan and to think about long-term Bitcoin accumulation the same way you do as like equity in a home or a 401k or something. It should just be like a third leg of the stool of your savings plan. Um, you know, so I've had that for years. I love it. I get some exercise. I hang with my kids, try to get some wifey time and I buy Bitcoin every single day, you know, hashtag swan and chill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. The, the first time when we had a call, you were surrounded with your kids and that was fantastic. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but this is, that is, this is a dollar cost averaging is something that I struggle with. A lot of my friends, when they ask me, uh, you know, they are new to Bitcoin and they want to buy Bitcoin. It's like, should they dollar cost average or should they put a chunk at one time? And I've read yeah. some reports and some, you know, like uh, statistical analysis at the back end where... Only during specific times, if you would have dollar cost average, you would have been better off than buying Bitcoin one time because, I mean, there's an upward bias, right? Because Bitcoin has increased exponentially over, a, over yeah. the last uh, 10 years. So, what? I, I, but of course, emotionally, it seems like DCA is better. But yeah, statistically, that's why. I think the you, just answered, say, you answered your own question. <laughs> it's because we're human, you know, and like okay. nobody sticks with it. So you can run all the models that you want, but we're emotional and... We're dumb apes and, you know, we buy shiny objects and we sell scary objects and that's just how we roll. So like literally if you don't instill the discipline of the routine and just have it kind of done for you, like we all just buy more Bitcoin when it's in the news every day and we all get scared and sell Bitcoin when like the bad headlines come out. Like you just, you just can't help it. You know, I think, I guess what, like 6% of people are basically sociopaths and maybe don't have that emotion. So if you're one of those 6%, <laughs> that's great. You'll be just fine. Um, you know, but I do say like, I mean, a lot of people are way under allocated. So they, they learn about Bitcoin, they get to the point where they want to buy some. And so what I say to family and friends who get into Bitcoin and have like a chunk and they're like, listen, my portfolio, I want it to be like 10% Bitcoin now. And I will set up an automatic recurring purchase. I'll do DCA after that. But what do I do with this million bucks right now? And what I always say is, okay. I get it, dude. You you read Inventing Bitcoin, you know, you you heard safety and on a podcast, like whatever it is, it's got you, you know, hot to trot. You want the orange coin. Uh, put half of it in right now and then set up an automatic recurring purchase for the next, you know, five weeks, 10% a week for the next five weeks. And what that basically is about is regret minimization. If it goes up a bit, at least you bought when you did. If it goes down a bit, you feel super smart because you're dollar cost averaging in as it goes down, you know. But what really usually happens is I don't know if I've ever seen anybody get through the whole five weeks because once you buy a bunch, then you go and read like six more books and listen to 300 hours of podcasts in the next two weeks and then you smash by the rest. It's really oh, hard once you've, made a mental, once you've made a mental decision to get into Bitcoin. What I say is like it's really hard to sleep in fiat. Like I, I rest easy when I feel like my allocation for Bitcoin over whatever time period has been met. I go back to sleeping like a baby. I don't have alerts going off on my Delta app. I'm not worried about stupid limit orders and all that crap. Like I'm just back to being a normal, productive member of society and, and being a good husband and father. <laughs> no, I agree. I think on the spectrum, that's what I kind of advise as well. Do you feel Bitcoin faces a risk of a, you know, this prolonged new macro environment of high interest rates, which, has, which it has never seen in the past? Yeah, I think it's going to be very interesting. Um, I, think what will be hap I think what will happen is it'll just put these fears to rest. That's what I think. I think Bitcoin is a secular growth story. I think it's the adoption of the world's best ever money, uh, basically a perfect money that we've never had before. And this is a technology adoption curve that happens to have a price. So I think it, it can look correlated to something in the near term. It can trade like the queues for 18 months. It can be affected by macro news. And then it'll just at some point just decouple from what the, what the near term narrative or the near term correlations were and just, you know, go on about its business of there's only 21 million of these and there's 8 billion of us and more and more people are going to want more and more value stored in Bitcoin over time. So, you know, the global market for store of value is between 400 and 500 trillion dollars. And so, you know, a million dollars a coin means that Bitcoin would be worth like 20 trillion market cap, which would be like 5% of the share of doing the job for which it is by far the best tool that we've ever had. 
So like literally it's better than anything else. It's designed to be better at storing value than anything else. It's just early. And so you're just being compensated for the volatility, like the returns that you see between now and what I perceive to be like its probable end state, you know, of being more or less stable and like kind of steadier growth in 30 years or something like that, where it's going to be worth like, you know, five to $10 million a coin in today's purchasing power. I think it'll be 25 to 50% of the global value uh, store value market at sort of like more of a steady state. Um, Cause people will still hold real estate and stocks and bonds and kinds of all, all other, other kinds of things, but you know, storing value, they'll, they'll have that be money. Um, but that's what you're being compensated for because it, it is risky and you have to put up with people saying you're dumb every once in a while when the price comes, goes down and, and you have to wade through the, uh, you know, the, the, the morass of, of shit coin information education, you know, pushed on you by people with, you know, impressive backgrounds and lots of word salad that doesn't mean anything. So that's the reward that you get for actually understanding and kind of seeing the truth is, uh, is the returns that, you know, people have seen historically and I expect will be uh, highly positive on the go forward as well. And this is financial yeah. advice because Bitcoin is not a security. I can say whatever the hell I want. Okay. That's great because I, I put a disclaimer just you know, every telegram and every tweet message. But and I think Bitcoiners like us have been posting about the performance of Bitcoin since the March 2020 crisis and comparing it with every other asset and saying that in spite of the current crash, Bitcoin has outperformed everything out there. Uh, so absolutely. But it is still a bear market and there have been large, uh, you know, announced layoffs from crypto players like Coinbase and BlockFi. How are you guys handling uh, this bear market at Swan? Uh, we're still hiring every week. We seem to be adding somebody. So, yeah, I mean, we're good. Again, we're kind of, I wouldn't say counter cyclical. We definitely do more revenue in a ripping bull market than a nascent bear market. Uh, we get lots, when the, when the number go up, when price goes up, we get way more revenue and way more users. When number goes down, we don't get a lot of new users, but we get a lot of uh, new revenue only when it's just kind of like sideways for a long time, do both of them just kind of tail off and it's boring. And then we just try to build a bunch of new things and cause we don't have to pick up the phone as much. Um, this is a bit of an anomaly because I got kind of like, uh, I guess known as like the shit coin slayer from the last couple of months of like hitting Luna square on and calling that collapse and then Celsius. So we've actually been totally jammed with new customers, which has never happened to us before in a, in a down market. Um, so that's new. Uh, and I hope that is kind of like a, a start of us being like a bit more divorced from the market cycle and kind of controlling our own destiny a bit more. Um, I think we're doing a lot of the smart things from a business strategy standpoint, like the recurrent. So the advisor services business is recurring revenue because they want to be charged on assets under management. So that's that's a recurring revenue stream. The IRA business has a per account monthly charge. So we have recurring there. Uh, we started something really cool that's actually a few YPO companies are already in, which is uh, the Bitcoin benefit plan, which basically lets any employer uh, give some Bitcoin to all their employees every month as a fringe benefit, like instead of a, a gym membership or, you know, some restaurant coupons or something, you can give them like a hundred bucks of Bitcoin every month. Um, so we've got, I think, like 26 companies in that now. Um, and I think there will be hundreds of thousands of people getting Bitcoin automatically from their employer in the next couple of years. So that's another fun one that you can hit me up about. I think, uh, you know, it's well deserved for Bitcoin companies to be attracting this kind of, you know, a new audience, uh, especially in the current uh, market. Uh, before we wrap up, uh, Corey, uh, how can people find you and how can people find Swan Bitcoin? Yeah, so I'm on Twitter at Corey Clipston, C-O-R-Y-K-L-I-P-P-S-T-E-N. Uh, any YPOer can email me at Corey at swan.com, C-O-R-Y at swan.com. I have a month, or I'm sorry, I have a daily newsletter that just highlights one of the best pieces of Bitcoin educational content from the history of Bitcoin. That's at corey.substack.com. Um, and yeah, and then I'm in the, uh, I'm in the YPO Bitcoin only Telegram group. That's a good place to get me. I'm pretty active on Telegram. And, and yeah, if you're interested in some of the things like Bitcoin or Ventures, yeah, or El Zonte Capital, where we actually, you know, Bitcoin or Ventures, you invest deal by deal. El Zonte Capital, you trust us to select and you don't have to think about it. Um, 
we've already invested in three so far, Jan3, which is Samson Mao's new company after he left Blockstream. Uh, and we invested in Galois, which is backed by, uh, by Craft Ventures with David Sachs. And then, uh, and then one more company um, that's doing like a, a Bitcoin backed credit card, which is kind of or line of credit, I should say, which is pretty neat. Um, so yeah, lots of exciting stuff going on in the, in the ecosystem. Definitely hit me up if you're interested in coming to the conference or just sign up at packbitcoin.com. Love to see a bunch of YPO people there. And I'm sure we can do, you know, like a dinner on Tuesday or Wednesday leading up to the conference and, and, you know, kind of have a YPO gathering down in Los Angeles as well. Lots of interesting stuff going on in Bitcoin and so on. Bitcoin seems to be right at the epicenter of it all. Corey, thank you for doing this and thanks for coming on Sunny Bitcoin. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Sunny. Mm-hmm.